And this is Pasha Svoas Khanam, as you all know. The second Pasha in the Chumash Dvori. And I explained last week, as you will know, Dvorim is different than the other four Chumashim. The other four Chumashim, Moshe Rabbeinu transmitted exactly the words that Hashem told him. It's called, he was like a conduit. You know what a conduit is? In this Chumash, the body, the Yomorah calls it like Moshe said it on his own. But Chas was wrong to say that Moshe said anything on his own in the Torah. What it means, the Rebbe explains, that Hashem told Moshe, and Moshe then absorbed it in his own mind. He understood it first for himself, and then he gave out to the Eden what he understood. And we could see in the Chumash Dvorim that it's a different, a different format completely. Moshe is speaking directly to the Eden, and the Chumash Dvorim is actually called as the Torah Shebe'al Peh in Torah Shebe'ksav. And this is like the link between Torah Shebe'ksav and Torah Shebe'al Peh. This is what ultimately allows and gives gives authenticity, gives kedusha to Torah Shabbat Because in the Torah Shabbat there is also this part of Torah Shabbat So even though Moshe repeats in this Chumash, in general repeats <coughs> much of what before, what happened before. And there are, of course, many, many mitzvahs in this Chumash that are not even mentioned before. And they're mentioned over here, of the only here, even though Moshe for sure taught them then, but it's not mentioned in the Torah. It's mentioned in the Torah only in this level of the Torah, of the, of the Torah. <clears throat> so even though this is just recounting what happened, but it's not recounting just like one recounts a historical fact. Moshe is recounting it with a certain emphasis, certain points that bring the events to us in a manner that we can relate to them differently and bringing out certain points that are pertinent to us. In this Parsha verse Hanan, this week's Parsha, we also have a repeat of the Aseris Hadibris. And Moshe recounts all the events, everything that took place prior to the Aseris and Dibris in preparing for the Aseris, the preparation for it. How even were afraid and, and so forth and how Hashem came down on the mountain and they asked Moshe to be their go-between and Hashem said the term the Aseris Adibris the 
Then, after the Aseris Adibris, Meisha goes on and says, these words, Zadvorim Ho'eilu, these words, Hashem spoke to you, to all of you. Making the emphasis that you should recognize that the Aseris Adibris and Hashem's coming down on the mountain, Moshe Rabbeinu says, remember, this is not something that you heard from someone. This is not something that you heard from me and you trust me. Not something that you heard from witnesses. Not something that I was able to prove to you. This is something that you yourselves witnessed. And we discussed in the, in the past that this principle, that we, every one of us, witnessed the Har Sinai, the Aseris Adibris. The Rambam says that this is actually the core, the essence that established a Muna within every Jew. A Muna in Hashem and a Muna in, in the Nevi, in Anobi. Because we saw it ourselves. There is an interesting halacha that exposes this idea. The halacha is that we, that if a novi is established to be a true novi, we are obligated to accept his words. We are obligated to accept the words of a novi. And the Torah says, before you accept his words, you first have to establish that he is a novi, a true novi. And a novi can be established various ways. One of the ways is that he had predicted the future, and it happened exactly the way he predicted. That's one way to establish a novi. And therefore, in, in that form of, of establishing a novi, we do not directly know that he is a novi. We didn't hear Hashem speak to him. But he has proven to us through, through this proof, through the fact that he was able to predict something in the future and it occurred, we have proved that he is a novi. And the Rambam explains that anything that a person knows through proof, through intellectual proof, lacks certainty. To be certain, uh, um, def uh, definitively, in other words, the definitive quality, uh, to be sure of it. Because it's all reasonable, it's all logical. Some people are more convinced by logical proof. Some people are less convinced. Some people do not have the intellectual power to identify and to understand the proof that it should convince them that this is so. Some people have a stronger intellectual power, and to them, proof is enough. So this is not really a conclusive a conclusive proof. And even if it were conclusive, it is only a proof, which means it didn't touch them themselves. It is something that they have in mind. If somebody asks them, how do you know? Oh, I have proof. It's not that he knows personally directly. No, it's okay. You want to explain it to him? Go ahead. You don't know it directly to a person. So the Ramam says that our belief in the Veen, although we do have to test a Novi and find out, prove to ourselves that he's a Novi Emes, but if once we know that he's a Novi Emes, then our trust in a Novi goes beyond the proof. What then is it based on? It's based on the fact 
that Moshe Rabbeinu in the Torah told us that we have to accept the words of another. Moshe Rabbeinu himself, that we know directly, that we saw. Moshe Rabbeinu we know not through proofs, not as a result of the miracles that he performed or anything else. This is something we know directly. And therefore, everything that follows from Moshe, that Moshe told us, we know not because of its proof, but because Moshe told us that this is what it is. For instance, to take a simple illustration of this principle, we know that at the Torah, if you want to establish a certain fact, Two witnesses, two witnesses establish a fact. That is universally true regarding what the situation could be a very trivial situation, could be a very important situation. Two witnesses establish a fact. Now, who are these two witnesses? Two people in the street. Two people from the street that you don't know anything about, you don't have any reason to suspect that they are not honest people. You have to assume that they are honest people. As I the time, Ayid has to be assumed that he is honest until proven dishonest. Two witnesses say a certain fact, and one on the other side says, no, this never happened. You don't care who the one is or who the two are. The one could be Moshe Rabbeinu. The two could be Dosen Vahaviru. We have to accept the testimony of Dosen Vahaviru. Because, not because they prove that it's true, but because so says the Torah. This is, in, in, in their words, comes through the words of Hashem, because Moshe Rabbeinu told us this. And everything that Moshe Rabbeinu told us is a direct, we heard it directly from Hashem. It's the same as if we heard it from Hashem. Mm -hmm. So Moshe Rabbeinu makes a very great big point over here. Part of it you already learned yesterday's Pasha. And we say it every day in Davnik. The, 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 from the six things to remember. He should be very careful, lest you forget what you heard at, when you stood at Har Sin, at Har Khoir, when you stood at Sin. But that moment we must not forget. Now, all of us here can ask the question, this occurred three and a half thousand years ago. We were not there. So how does that affect us? The answer is, and we will develop this in today, the answer is that in fact we were not there, but all the Nishomas for all generations were there. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, all Yidin, throughout all the generations are offshoots, are, are, are uh, sparks from the 600,000 Nishomas that stood at Hasim. Huh? Generation. Every generation throughout the, throughout the ages. That's something else. That's something else. That's the representative of that day. But in terms of Nishomas Israel, all the Shomis, the 600,000 Nishomis of the Yidin that were stood there, this is what's called Nishomis Kloliyos. They were general Nishomis, encompassing all the future Nishomis of all times. So, that experience and that witness that, we, that they saw, this imbued Nobody knows what the word imbued means. It impressed, 
in our nations. This faith, this recognition, the recognition of this truth, and that remains as part of the nation. And all the Shomis following to other generations have that as part of their essence. Now, it's possible for a person, for a Yid, to walk the street, like we, we know today, people don't know anything, they don't even know that they're Jewish. They know nothing about it. But deep down, they are Jews. And they know this truth without being aware of it. And when this truth is revealed to them, they readily relate to it. They can relate to it. Personally. Not by proof, but personally. This we witness in our time. This we witness simply from the fact you come to Ayit, a total stranger, a total stranger to you, and a total stranger to the Jewish people, platform. and you tell them, Ayit has to put on feeling. And he says, What's feeling? You take a leather box and put it on your arm, and wrap the straps around your hand, and you put the leather box on your head. That's called feeling. Now, anybody, can you make sense of it? doesn't make any sense at all. And yet, Ayit puts on film, and he thanks you, says, oh, I feel good. I feel good. There's something t- touching. He doesn't know what. No way. He can't even describe what it, how it touched him. But he, somehow he relates, if this is a word from the Torah, he relates to it. Even though his neshama was dormant, was kept behind bars for all these years. I mentioned to yesterday in class that we learned that, that many people relate to me their experiences. My son in, in, in Long Island said to me there was this yid who would not put on film for nothing. He would always reject, no, no, it's not for me. Finally, somehow, he got to to him, and he says, whatever, well, do it for me. You know, be friends, do it for me. He consented to put on film. He put on film. This is an older man, successful businessman. He puts on the film, and he breaks out in sobs, in crying, uncontrollable crying. All these years he was holding himself back with iron chains not to allow himself to go out and to accept something that he doesn't understand. But it was gnawing at him. It was pushing him. Why? What is that? That is a reality that we cannot deny because we saw it with our own eyes. We experienced it. This is part of us. To further clarify this point, Moshe Rabbeinu says, after the Maaser Zadibris, he says, these words Hashem spoke to your entire congregation, we were all there, <coughs> and it was a coil god oil, a great voice, Blo Yosef. Blo Yosef. Blo Yosef literally means there was no increase, no add, nothing, no, no increase. So this Lo Yosef, Rashi says simply, Lo Yosef means that this never repeated itself again. It was just this one time, it was never repeated again. No, Yosef, it didn't happen again. There's a Sikha from Reb, and I want to discuss this Sikha with you a little bit. What the Gemara says, 
that lo yosof means lo hoyo lo baskoil. He did not have an echo. He did not rever- reverberate. Normally, a voice. There's a secondary voice. When you scream something out, there's a secondary voice. This one did not have a secondary voice. Lo Yosef. Huh? It didn't increase, didn't add. There was no add, no add to it. So I said there are many meanings to that, but one, the Yomara says, Lo Yosef means Lo Yoyo Lo Baskoil. It didn't have a secondary voice. So the Rebbe explains a phenomenal thing. What's so significant about the fact that there was no secondary voice? No basco. On the one hand. On the other hand, why shouldn't it be? The more the bigger the voice, the basco the basco shows that it's a big voice, a big sound. It reverberates, it hits all the mountains and, and, and repeats itself. The bigger the voice, the bigger the basco. And there was no basco, and one could say, oh, maybe it was a soft voice. I didn't reverberate. And the Torah says, no, it was called Godoy, but the Lord Yosef, without a basco. That explains the following phenomenon. A bus coil, an echo, is formed by the voice hitting an obstacle. The voice hitting a wall that does not allow the voice to go through, and the voice reverberates, just like a ball jumps back when it hit, hit, hits a wall. When there was no basco, what does that mean? That the voice did not hit an obstacle. Because nothing in the world is an obstacle for that voice. That voice was able to penetrate everything in the world. Nothing was an obstacle, nothing stopped this voice. And therefore, there was no secondary word, no, no, no reverberation. The Rebbe further explains that, that this phenomenon, that the voice did not, was not rejected, there was no obstacle to the voice, means two things. It means two things. One thing is that it was such a powerful voice that nothing can stop it. It goes through anything. Another thing is that this voice had no opposition. Everything absorbed the voice. When is the voice rejected? When is the voice reverberating? When it hits an article that cannot absorb, cannot relate to this voice. But this voice came from Hashem, and everything was able to absorb, to relate to this voice. You can, you can absorb it. These two aspects, and these two very different reasons for for not creating a, an echo, apply to two different parts in the world. In the world, we have we have clippers. We have impurities. We have things that oppose godliness. The Alter Rebbe says that these clippers, clipper, certain impurities, we can't elevate them. We cannot bring them into holiness. 
we have to break through them. So these were, the voice was able to break through. But everything else that could relate to godliness was able to absorb and be, and accept this voice. He did not feel, nothing felt like this is something coming at me from outside, I can relate to it. Everything was able to relate to it. Particularly, most importantly for us, the Jewish soul, and even the, what we call the animal soul within the Jew have no rejectional attitude. Or no, no, it would not reject any, any of that voice. It was able to accept and relate to it. And I want to discuss this phenomenon a little bit. The reason I want to discuss this is that we all form certain ideas. We come to learn, and we learn something in the Torah that we don't understand. And sometimes we become frustrated, and we say, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I can't accept it. God forbid for I need to say it, but it's possible to have that, that feeling. It doesn't make sense. So we have to understand, we have to understand the following true principle. In today's Pasha, which you already learned, it says, that the Torah is Chochmaschem Uvinaschem Le'ine Ho'amim. Everybody learns this? The Torah is your wisdom and your, and your smart, your understanding. Le'ine Ho'amim in the eyes of the nations. What does that mean? The eyes of the nations. What about for yourselves? The Torah doesn't serve you also as your wisdom? The answer is that, in fact, to us, directly ourselves, it goes beyond our wisdom. Wisdom is already a lower level than the way we absorb and relate to Torah. We relate to Torah, as we said before, we saw it with our own eyes. What you see in your eyes, you don't need, with your eyes, you don't need wisdom to, to tell you I saw it. We heard it directly. We saw Hashem. So to us, it reaches in a totally different way. It doesn't reach us through our wisdom. It reaches us directly. No Yosef, there was no, no Baskin, there was no echo. We did not have to echo it back and say, okay, what did you say? Let me see. Do I understand it? What does it mean? There was no secondary thought. It was absorbed by the soul completely. Because we can relate to these words, to the words of the Torah, to the words of the Sarah fully. Nothing, nothing in our soul has any controversy. With, 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 with time, with Hashem. This is us completely. Then afterwards, we can have, we can translate this insight and this personal relationship to Torah into wisdom, into Seichel. Or we can understand it and we can then understand also how this 
emuna, this trust, this, this faith, should be translated in action. In order to know how to act, you have to have wisdom to understand how this is supposed to be. Like for instance, Hashem says you should keep Shabbos. It says in Aseret Adibur, Shomer is Zocher is Yimah Shabbos. Shomer is Yimah Shabbos. You should remember and keep Shabbos. We have no problem with that. Shabbos is a holy day. Now, how do you how do you keep Shabbos? For that, you need wisdom to know how you do it. But it's the essence of the Torah, this is something which we have, we don't need wisdom to accept. This we accept directly, just as we saw it at Hatsina. Everything in the Torah. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu, at first he said, this is your wisdom in the eyes of the nations. For the nations, the older nations know about it is that it's a wise thing. It's a chukim, mishpotim, tzatikim, these are righteous laws, and the nations will respect you for your wisdom, for your uprightness, for your decency. And this is the way the nations look at us. What it means to us is a totally different thing. To us, this is us. This is one thing with us. Just to deviate a little bit, on the lighter note, I mentioned to you many times the story of, of the Aviza. Everybody knows her, the Aviza. The Aviza was in Tzfas, and in the same city was the Beis Yosef, who wrote the Shukhan The Arizo was the rabbi, and the source was the rov. Pretty nice combination over there. So, the Yosef, who was a diligent student of Torah, of Nigla, his learning, his diligence in learning was completely unique. Uh, a lot of written about it that was an unusual diligence. So the Bess Yosef, one time he was sitting and he was learning a certain Tosfus in the Gemara. And he had a difficulty in the Tosfus. And he labored over the Tosfus for many hours. He worked hard in the Tosfus and finally he got to understand the Tosfus. You know the story, right? I mentioned it many times. He understood the Tosfos. And then he went into Bismedrish. And he comes into Bismedrish and he sees two young men sitting and learning. You take a look, he's learning, they're learning the same Tosfos that he just now finished laboring over. So he was curious, he wanted to see how they are going to learn it. They're learning it. And they talk it out. And they go smoothly without a hitch, not a single stumble. And they say the pshat and the place was the way the Ben Yosef came to conclude after hours of labor. Yosef was taken aback. And he couldn't understand what, what's happening over here. So he went to the Ari. The Ari is who knows the hidden things, what's going on in the world. He told him the story, he told him, what happened over here? So the Arizal explained to the Bish Yosef that this chokhmah, this insight that you have discovered, that you have worked on, did not exist in the world before. And as long as it did not, it was not brought down into the world. It was impossible to get to it. This is why you had to labor so hard to get it. Once you labored, once you brought it down into the world, then it became property, a presence in the world. 
And then they were able to learn it smoothly without a hitch. So you provided for them. Hmm? Of course. Ah, ah, okay, I'll, I'll answer you this question in a minute. I'll, I'll go back to this in a minute. I just want to connect to what I said so we don't lose continuity. Good, very good question. The point which I want to make is that when we learn, we think we learn with our mind, with our seichel. We learn because we relate to the truth of Torah. And everything in the truth of Torah that was given, that was brought down, we have it, we, we sense it. We have it in our souls. And then when we come to learn it, it comes easy to us. In other words, in our souls, we already know it before we ever learned it. And then when we come to learn it, it's we're drawing it from, from this resource, from the insight that we have. Because the truth of it, we already have before we even learn it. Learning it is only to reveal at the intellectual level this truth. But we have it before. Now, let me take a minute to answer your question, which is a very profound question. Okay? Time is asking a very strong question. It says, the Bala HaToysvis, when they wrote the Toysvis, they learned it. So they already, it would seem new, so they were brought it down into the world. So why was it so difficult for the Bish Yosef to, to why did he have to label it? And this is actually in line with what we are discussing here. Every word in Torah, there's a Rashi brings down from the Gemara, that Dibri Torah is kepati shifoitz itself. It's like when you take a, an axe and you hit a rock, you hit a, a rock, a stone, and it cracks it and it goes into multiple little pieces. You fight it. You pieces. A, a rock. So the Torah presents the rock. This is this is the, the, the essence of the truth. Now, when you start you start breaking this rock apart, you find all kinds of different pieces. The one who presented this rock, the, the initial thought, he didn't necessarily think of all these pieces. But he presented a true, a, a thoroughly, a universally true statement of Torah that had to be true from every angle because he knew that this is true. Whether he went through every, every crack and crevice, every little atom that's in the rock, not necessarily. So then when you discover that, in the, that there is some kind of a contradiction between this statement and something else, that you're discovering and you have to find where the truth is, how it is, how to reconcile it. But he presented the truth as it, as it is. So every true statement in the Torah does not mean that it was initially that all the questions that were asked that are asked now have been then considered. One thing we know huh? considered were asked. We only do we do know that every statement is true in itself. And if you have a question, it could be because we have a short sighted short shortness on it could be we have a real question and we have to reconcile it. But the truth of it is not moved, it's not punched. Because this truth emanates from the truth of time. There is, to, to, to illustrate to you this, this thing, there are several times in the Gemara 
There is Rav. You heard of Rav. Rav is one of the great Amiroim, one of the first Amiroim of the Gemara. And Rav says a halach. It happened several times. Rav says a halach. And one of his Talmidim asks him a kasha on his halach. And Rav, it says, Shosik Rav. And Rav remained quiet. He didn't answer him. He was quiet. It's an interesting thing. You would think if Rav remained quiet, that means he didn't have an answer, that means that his aloha was refuted. Not so. It means that he could not formulate an answer to the question, but he remained in his opinion. And as a fact, the halacha is like this opinion that the, to which there is an unanswered question. Because he saw the truth of this halacha, he recognized it in the depth of his mind, and says, this is how it is. And if I can't answer every one of your questions, or I can't formulate an answer to it, it does not refute the halacha. It happened several times. All this is telling us, this is what we said, that even at Harsinai saw the truth. And then the, this voice is lo Yosef. There was no rejection. It was absorbed fully by our souls. And we initially essentially know the truth, as I said, in, the, in, 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 in essence, before we even learn it. And everything we learn in Torah lends itself, allows itself for us to understand it because it's us. The Torah and us are one thing. I illustrate this concept that the union of godliness, the union of the Muna in Hashem, the union of Torah is one thing with us, with the following, with the union of Kriya Shema. As a matter of fact, Shema Yisroel, the Pasha of Shema Yisroel, which we're all familiar with, is also in today's Pasha. In the same Pasha, where there's, uh, there's, there is a repeat, when Moshe Rabbein repeats the Eden, the phenomenon of standing at Hasina, and the Aseris Adibris, and he says, Lo Yosef, that this voice was absorbed by you, Neshamis. Then, at the end of the Pasha, he says, Shema Yisro. The, the Pasha Shema Yisro, which we say every day, twice a day. It's like the greatest hit. Huh? It's like the greatest hit. The greatest hit, right. And this Shema Yisro, I always mention this, and it's something which behooves us to, to reflect on. We all know that when we say Shema Yisrael, we have to cover our eyes. Why? Because Shema Yisrael is of such depth that, that anything that we should see, that we will see, will, will, will be a disruption, will be a distraction. It's between us and Hashem and that's it. Just the truth itself. We cover our eyes, we don't want to close our eyes. We put a covering on our eyes to show that I'm now in the, not in this world. I'm away, I'm in my own, my own mind. That's how we're supposed to say Shema Yisrael. And then the Shechon explains what are we supposed to reflect on, recognize when you say Shema Yisrael. We're supposed to recognize that Hashem Aleikeinu that our God is Hashem Echod, is one God. And what is this oneness? So the, the Shechonorach explains that you don't just think that he's one, but you, you elaborate a little bit. You have to think in terms of, of your entire, of the entire existence. Because Echod, the word Echod, consists of three letters, Aleph and Ches and Dal. The Aleph in, in, in the in the in the in the 
alphabet in the Aleph base, Aleph stands for numerically one, the Ches stands numerically for eight, and the Dalet stands numerically for four. So these Aleph, one, eight, and, da- and four represent this principal thought that you that you are that you are reflecting on my yacht. What are these numbers? Ches, the eight. Eight represents up and down. How so? Because there are seven levels upwards. It's called seven Rikim, seven heavens. And the earth, which is the bottom. So the other they form eight. So eight forms the up, the up to the to the up, to the utmost extent, the extent of the highest up, and the and the lower to the lowest down, the earth which is the lowest down. The dollar is four, which of course represents the four sides, the four corners of the world. Even though we can think of the world as, as a circle, you know, it's all over the place. But the Torah, everything in the Torah is presented to us to fit with our thinking process, the way we think, the way we relate to things. We relate to things up and down, not as a cube, not as a, as a ball, as a, and, we, and we relate to things as front and back side and, and the sides. We don't relate to things in terms of our soul. So the Torah also presents space in that form, up and down and, and, and four sides. The Besamikdash was built also with straight walls, with, with front and back, East and West, everything is like that. Okay, so what is the Kavono? What are we supposed to reflect in Shema Yisrael? That the Ches and Dala, that the up and down, and, and right and left and front and back, which encompasses the entire space, is all Aleph, Echad, is all contained within this one. Is all bottled in one in Hashem, which is one. It's all one. This is what we reflect in Shema Yisrael. So now the question is, if we are talking in terms of space, why do we close our eyes? Why do we cover our eyes? We should open our eyes and look up and down and look front and back and sideways and say all of this is, is, is one with Hashem. What space are we talking about when we close the eyes, our eyes? The answer is that we are, yes indeed, we are talking about the space that we see. But before we talk about the space that we see, we talk about the space that is us, that is in our own mind, the reality of our own mind. In other words, what we are saying in Hashem Echod, not that Hashem is one in this external space. Hashem is one in the space that is that we conceptualize in our own mind. The reality of our own existence, which consists of, also of space. This is one. In other words, we are not talking about some kind of a logical explanation. We talk about the reality of our own existence. This is the Shema Yisrael. This is why we closed our eyes. Because when we open our eyes, we see all the things. We have to start arguing with ourselves. This also, this also, is this too? Now there's a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of things. When we, when we cover our eyes, there is no this also. There is only one thing. The reality of, of existence. And in that reality of existence, we recognize that there is only one reality. 
then when we open our eyes, then we begin to translate that recognition of this reality, we begin to translate it to the world that we observe. He's saying, you should do and should learn and so forth. There's much that's elaborated, that's explained on this thing. That's the way when it comes into Chochmah, when it comes into wisdom, into understanding. But the initial in English, my Israel, this is beyond that. This is what we really stand for. Who we are. And this, with who we are, we don't need wisdom, we don't need explanations, we just have to close our eyes and think, what's the reality? And we have only one reality. This is what was embedded in us, imbued in us, at Matan Torah. Because we, we really participated, we really saw the truth. Rashi says that <coughs> Matan Torah, <coughs> the entire existence, showed only one thing. And this was impressed in our souls. This is how I eat sees things for all times, for thousands of years, and will never change. And you cannot change under any circumstances. And when we come to Torah, we come to mitzvahs, to learning and davening, when, they, when we find some difficulty with it, we have to understand that this is a little dust that covers our own truth. This is not a difficulty that is really our personal difficulty. This is not us, it is something which is an add-on to us, that blocks us from seeing the truth as we see it. Like a person who is in prison, he cannot go and do what he himself wants. Our souls can also be in prison. And therefore we we work hard to release them from prison. I remember in the early years um, <clears throat> Hadar Toira, which is, you know, Hadar Toira, there's also school in uh, Yeshiva for Bali Shuva. And um, in the early years, I was teaching in Hadar Toira. There was a Talmud there that came. Um, a young, a young boy. He was 19, 1920. Very sincere boy. He started learning for the first time in his life, to him. And he saw, hey, this is the real thing. This is what I really want. And he felt. He felt pained because his whole training in school and high school and all that didn't allow him to relate to it with his whole heart. Like we say, he was relating to it with his logic, with his faith. But he wanted to relate to it. He said, this is not me. I want to relate to me to it as, as my thing, as me, to the real thing. And as I'm learning, I still feel to, uh, I'm in prison. I believe it, I understand it. But that's not me. I'm not learning it as my thing. So this is a story that he himself related to me. At one time, he came to me and said, you know, I broke through. I broke through. I broke out of prison. And he tells me the following episode. He says he was very, very in pain, very much in pain from this feeling that he's an outsider. He can't relate to Torah personally. And this gnawed at him and it bothered him very deeply. One time he took a walk down Eastern Parkway, went into botanical gardens, and he sat down on a bench and he started reflecting on this thing and, and, he, and he started to cry. He says, I was crying like a baby. And after that he said, I felt I was released. It's an actual experience. And uh, this young man 
truly, you wouldn't believe that I mean, his his uh, a lifer, out lifers the lifers. <laughs> With the Siddhish Yerid, and his Amuna is so pure that there is no, there is no, there is no Yosef, there is no Baskel. Okay, he broke through. The point is, this is true by all of us. You have to understand, this is our thing. The Torah is our thing. It's not something we're learning from outside. If we have a difficulty, so be it. We we'll labor a little more. Either we break through or we won't break through. It's still our thing. It's still our thing. And eventually, Mitzvah everyone will be able to relate to Torah straight from his soul without any obstacles, without any, any battles, without any questions. Questions on the seichel level is fine, but not on the personal level. It's like this is my thing, and then we begin to live with the Torah, and the Torah starts living in us. So that when we close our eyes, what do we see? We see one truth. We don't just start thinking, "What do I see?" We see one truth with closed eyes. When you open our eyes, we get confused. But we close our eyes, we see only one truth. We wish we got Sliach, every one of us, to grow on all fronts, to learn and to become lumbering, and to know and open our hearts and our minds. And the main, most important thing is to open, to have an opening to our souls. That's the most important of all. Then we come to life. His birthday today. Thank you. It's not a flock, but it's a good year.